very, very much for coming out. Oh, you guys don't have any seats, huh? All right, you're standing. Okay. And let me thank Locke and Tobias for their introductions. Um, so what we'll do is I'll chat for five or six hours. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, chat for a while. We'll open it up for your comments and your thoughts. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, let me just begin by talking a little bit about what's kind of the momentum that we are seeing uh, in our campaign here in Iowa and around uh, the country. Um, one of the reasons that I think we stand an excellent chance to win here in Iowa is because we are doing meetings precisely like this. Uh, last night we were in Sioux City and we had something like 1,200 people out. <laughs> Tonight, I, as I understand it, we'll be in Council Bluffs and we'll have, I don't know, 12, 1,400 people out is what we expect. And we're doing meetings like this all over the state. And the reason we're doing meetings like this is this is the way I've always done politics and what I love to do. I have had in my state of Vermont hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meetings exactly like this. Talk, people ask questions. And what I love about it is this is what democracy in America is supposed to be about and what happens much too rarely. Uh, people are alienated, I think, and, and uh, unhappy with the political process. And what we are going to try to do in this campaign is to do something pretty radical, which is called practice democracy. I believe in democracy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for better or for worse, you're going to see me a whole lot in your state <laughs> in the next six weeks. We're going to be running all over the state. And again, I think, you know, when we began this campaign, uh, we were probably three, five percent in the polls nationally, probably not much different here in Iowa. Uh, but we have, uh, I think, moved very rapidly. I think the message that we are uh, bringing forth is one that's resonating in this state and resonating all over this country. But let me just give you an update, if I might, about some of the events of the last week. Uh, this week, last week, we won the endorsement of the Communication Workers of America, the CWA. That's a union of 700,000 workers. And we're very proud of having won that. Uh, literally on that same day, uh, we won the endorsement of Democracy for America, which is one of the largest uh, grassroots progressive organizations in America of about a million people. And here's what's very interesting about this. Uh, the guy who started DFA, Democracy for America, is an old, old friend of mine. We don't agree on every issues. On every issue, his name is Howard Dean. You all know Howard. Uh, and how it obviously is the former governor of the state of Vermont, and how it I, how it I, and I have worked together and known each other for, I don't know how many years, 30 or more years. And uh, what was interesting is he started DFA for all the right reasons. Uh, he wanted to see grassroots activism develop. But, and I say this, uh, Howard and I have a difference of opinion on this campaign. He is supporting Secretary Clinton. But here's what's interesting. What, he did, and his brother did, who's running uh, DFA and others, they said, okay, yes, Governor Dean is supporting Hillary, Hillary Clinton, but we think the members should be able to participate in a free and fair election. And I respect that. Not every organization would allow that to happen, to be honest. There are ways you can prevent that. And their rules were that any candidate who got 62 thirds of the vote, 66 percent of the vote, would get their endorsement. That was their rules. Well, they opened it up to people. They had something like, I think, 270,000 people voting. We got 87% of the vote. Okay. And I say that, and, and Democracy for America will now be a strong ally of us in, in this campaign. But what I say is two things. On one, obviously, I was gratified to get 87% of the vote. But more importantly, I want to respect and thank Governor Dean for allowing a free and fair election to take place, even when he is disagreeing with me in terms of the, uh, the campaign and who is he supporting. Uh, the other interesting development, which is of, I think, great significance uh, that also occurred this week, is uh, that we just announced a few days ago that we have received in this campaign 2.3 million individual contributions. 2.3 million. <laughs> um, 
And that comes from a hair less uh, than um, a million people. So we've got a, a, almost a million people making contributions and many of them making more than one contributions. Now why is that important? Well, number one, it's important because that is more contributions that have come into a campaign than any campaign in American history up until this point. So Obama did very, very well in both 2008 and 2012. At this particular point, we are doing better. That's point number one. Number two, which is actually more important. When we began this campaign, uh, we were told by uh, political pundits and all of the great experts out there, they said, Bernie, if you want to run a serious national campaign, you have to understand that it requires a whole lot of money. Otherwise, it's really a futile uh, effort. And the only way you can raise all of that money is through a super PAC. Now, all of you know, and I'll talk about this in a moment, is that as a result of this disastrous 5 to 4 Supreme Court decision on Citizens United, uh, what the Supreme Court said is that billionaires can pour as much money as they want into the political process. So all of the candidates on the Democratic side, almost all on the Republican side, have started these super PACs. And they're raising huge sums of money. They're raising, in most cases, more money from their super PACs than they are from their campaigns, which makes them obviously dependent on a small number of very, very wealthy people. We decided not to do that. I do not represent uh, the... Um, I don't represent corporate America. I don't represent the billionaire class. So we decided we don't want their money. We're not going to ask for their money. But then the question is, could we raise enough money to run a serious campaign? Well, it turns out that we can. And that was an extraordinary outpouring of support from the middle class and working families of this country. Uh, we have received 2.3 million uh, individual contributions. And that is just mind-blowing to me. So the importance of that, and I think what we are showing, this is a big deal, is that at a time when a small number of families are contributing a significant amount of the total money coming into campaigns, we are saying, you know what, we can do it another way. We do not have to be dependent on large corporations or the wealthy and the powerful. We can run a campaign based on contributions averaging 30 bucks a piece from the middle class and working families. So that's pretty revolutionary, and I am proud of that. Other point that I want to make before we get into other issues. Uh, all of you know, and I don't have to go at this moment to great length, uh, about what happened in Paris uh, last month, the, ISIS, the, the, the horrendous ISIS attack there. And you know what happened in San Bernardino. And, and people are feeling, uh, appropriately so, they're feeling anxious and nervous uh, about uh, national security issues. But what I want to say is the media, very often in our country, unfortunately, thinks that the American people are pretty dumb and that all you can deal with are six-second sound bites and all you can deal with is one issue at a time. So I have been criticized because I think that we have got to deal with national security, and I will tell you exactly my view as to how we crush and destroy ISIS. But what media sometimes says is, why are you continuing to talk about other issues? You only should focus on national security issues. Well, I disagree. When the middle class of this country is disappearing, when many of your families are seeing people working longer hours for low wages, when many of you cannot afford to send your kids to college, when we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of only almost any major country on earth, when we have massive levels of income and wealth inequality, when we have a corrupt campaign finance system, when the scientists tell us that climate change is the greatest threat facing this planet from an environmental perspective, I'm not going to ignore those issues. So I don't, I respect the American people, and I think, yes, we have got to talk about ISIS, yes, we have got to talk about national security, but we have got to also talk about all of the other issues that impact working families and the middle class. Now, one of the other Obviously, developments that's taking place in this campaign has been the political rise and political success at this point of Donald Trump. And I just want to say a few words about Trump before I get to the thrust of my remarks. Trump is a demagogue. And what demagogues do 
is they play on the fears and anxieties of people. That's true all over the world. He's not the first to do this. And what they do is at a time when people are nervous about national security issues, and they are, at a time when people are very unsettled about the economy, people are asking, why is it that a man worker today, with all of the increase in technology and productivity, why is the median male worker, that guy right in the middle of the economy, making $700 less in inflation adjusted for dollars than he did 42 years ago? Why is that? And people are anxious. If you're that guy who's working incredibly long hours, you're wondering, why is it? What's going on? What is the reason? Why is that median woman worker, that woman in the middle of the economy, making a thousand bucks less than she made in 2007? They are anxious. Now, what you do rationally is you look at these issues. Why is the middle class disappearing? Why are real wages, inflation adjusted for wages, going down? Let's talk about that and let's solve those problems. And that's what our campaign is about. <clears throat> what Trump is doing is saying, is saying, okay, those are the issues, but the problem is Muslims coming into this country. The problem is that you got a Latino worker in this country making eight bucks an hour, and that's the reason why the middle class in this country is disappearing. So let me be very clear. A Latino worker working in California in the fields in very difficult work is not the reason why the middle class in this country is disappearing. And Muslims coming into this country is not the reason why the middle class in this country is disappearing. The reason that the middle class in this country is disappearing is because of corporate greed, because of the greed and recklessness of Wall Street. Our job is to bring people together, not to separate them. Yeah. Donald Trump talks about making America great. Well, let me suggest to you Trump is of the view that having a low minimum wage is not a bad thing for this country. Having a low minimum wage is not a bad thing for this country. That's Trump's view. You don't make America great by seeing millions of people work for eight, nine, or ten bucks an hour. I guess if you're a billionaire, it's okay. But not if you're a low income worker. It is not a great thing for America. We don't make America great when we have Trump saying we have to be competitive with the world. Our taxes are too high. Our wages are too high. Everything is too high. We have to compete with other countries. What does he mean by that? Our wages are too high in America? Really, Mr. Trump? Go out and talk to tens of millions of people who are trying to make it on 10, 12, 15 bucks an hour. They don't think that wages are too high in America. They think we have to raise the minimum wage to a living wage. And when Mr. Trump talks about taxes being too high, what his major solution is to provide $269 billion in tax breaks for the top three-tenths of 1% millionaires and billionaires in this country by repealing the estate tax. Huge tax breaks for the wealthiest people in this country. Well, I don't think those policies are going to make America great. How I think we make America great is we bring our people together around a progressive agenda that tells the billionaire class in this country they are not going to continue to get it all. They're not going to continue to get huge tax breaks when we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth. They're not going to be able to continue to ship our jobs to China and other low-wage countries. They're going to start reinvesting in the United States of America. They're not going to cut the wages and the health care and the pensions of their workers and then give huge compensation packages to the CEOs of those corporations. We are going to make America great when we expand the middle class of this country, when we create millions of decent paying jobs, 
when we have a health care system that guarantees health care all people as a right, when we have paid family and medical leave for all of our people, and when we have a tax system which is fair, which demands that corporate America and the wealthiest people in this country start paying their fair share of taxes. That's how we make America great.